Cardiovascular disease is the biggest killer across the globe, causing 20 million deaths every year. And drinking alcohol directly contributes to cardiovascular disease. Yet for many years, the idea that alcohol, particularly red wine, is good for the heart has inundated our media, policy debates, and been spread by industry misinformation. Over the past decade, new study designs have improved our understanding, concluding with the World Heart Federation stating that, contrary to popular opinion, alcohol is not good for the heart. So which cardiovascular issues does alcohol cause? Why do observational studies suggest alcohol is good for the heart? And how has the alcohol industry tried to influence worldwide research on the topic? Cardiovascular disease is a collection of diseases, and the risks vary for different conditions. As the World Heart Federation states, alcohol increases the risk of high blood pressure, hypertensive heart disease, stroke, and atrial fibrillation, among other conditions. The latest NHS data shows that in 2021, 45% of all alcohol-related hospital admissions using their broad measure were for cardiovascular disease, amounting to over 400,000 admissions. And across the World Health Organization's European region, cardiovascular disease is the third biggest alcohol-related killer, accounting for almost 20% of all alcohol deaths. In the UK, that would mean around 5,000 deaths each year. Regularly drinking 100 grams of alcohol a week, which equates to 12.5 UK units, when compared with drinking 25 grams or less, is linearly associated with a higher risk of heart failure, stroke, fatal hypertensive disease and fatal aortic aneurysm. Alcohol is also dense in calories, so weight gain from drinking and unhealthy eating when drinking also increase the risk of heart disease. So why have we consistently seen media stories about alcohol, particularly light or moderate drinking and red wine, being good for the heart? Firstly, let's take red wine. Some argue that there is a beneficial effect of red wine because it contains a polyphenol called resveratrol, which may have life-extending properties. However, studies that suggest this have been studies of mice, which were given very high doses of resveratrol. To get the same dose that improved health in mice, you'd have to drink between 600 and 3,700 bottles of red wine every day. And resveratrol is also found in products such as grapes, peanuts and apples. There are three main reasons for why our view of whether alcohol is good for the heart has changed. One, most alcohol studies are observational. Two, Many of these are unrepresentative, and three, due to the influence of the alcohol industry. Evidence regarding alcohol's effect on the cardiovascular system is almost solely based on observational studies. This is where a group is observed over a number of years to determine how a risk factor, such as drinking alcohol, is associated with a certain outcome, such as cardiovascular disease or cancer. The gold standard for proving an effect would be a randomised controlled trial but there are ethical and practical reasons for why these rarely take place. So it would be really difficult to run a randomised controlled trial to look at an outcome such as cardiovascular disease. Um, it would be unethical to randomly allocate people to drink heavily. We know that there are associated risks in terms of cancer risk, so we, we really couldn't do that. Um, and it would take many, many years to follow people up. So we have to rely on observational studies um, from population-based cohort studies. And we observe what happens in the real world. Um, and this isn't straightforward because we know that people who choose not to drink or people who drink a lot are very different in other characteristics, um, perhaps related to other lifestyle factors like smoking and exercise and diet. Um, and then it's really difficult to tease apart whether the effects we're seeing are due to the alcohol consumption or other factors um, associated with um, drinking. These observational studies typically follow up thousands of participants over several years, and then they compare groups with different drinking patterns in terms of their health outcomes attempting to take account of other risk factors like smoking or obesity, as well as other aspects of their health and life circumstances. So what do these studies show? So there are a lot of studies that suggest drinking a small or moderate amount of alcohol may reduce our risk of cardiovascular disease compared to not drinking, and also that those who drink heavily have an increased risk. And so this is called this U or J-shaped curve, where it dips under. 
But the more that researchers adjust or take into account factors associated with drinking, such as smoking, um, other lifestyle factors, this apparent beneficial effect, the sort of the U part of the, of the curve, becomes less and less and, and it and actually um, might even disappear completely. So we have to be really careful in terms of all these other factors that are associated with drinking. Um, and people who choose to drink moderate and small amounts um, may have other potentially health benefits um, associated with them, such as uh, not, not smoking a lot, um, taking lots of exercise, um, having a good diet, um, and maybe a higher socioeconomic profile. These other lifestyle factors are crucial because they may be the actual cause of observed health outcomes, such as better or worse cardiovascular health. And we know that there are many ways in which people who drink are different to those who do not drink. Some important confounders in alcohol research and most epidemiological studies include socioeconomic status, more economically advantaged and educated groups are also more likely to drink and in particular to drink red wine. They will have all manner of reasons for being generally healthier than disadvantaged groups, such as a healthier diet and better healthcare, both of which can mitigate the harm of alcohol. Prior health status, or the sick quitter effect. Doctors will often recommend that people stop drinking if they have an illness or disease. This will artificially make abstainers look less healthy than people who continue to drink. A 2024 study found that over 70% of the systematic reviews and meta-analyses published before mid-2022 did not exclude former drinkers from the reference group and would therefore be biased by the sick quitter effect. And smoking and obesity. Different drinking groups also smoke different amounts and have different levels of obesity, which could be causing the differences in disease outcome. In recent years, research methods have been developed which can take better account of these confounders to come to a more accurate conclusion of the causal effect of alcohol on disease outcomes. One of these methods is called Mendelian randomization, named after the biologist Gregor Mendel, which uses inherited genetic variants to create a natural experiment. Genetic makeup is defined at conception and is almost random at population level. Random distributions of genetic variants cause different reactions to alcohol, with some people metabolising it fine, and others having severe headaches, heart palpitations or flushing. These reactions are strongly associated with how much alcohol people drink, so researchers can use these genetic variants to group individuals instead of grouping by how much alcohol they actually consume. This avoids accidentally grouping sick quitters together or more economically advantaged people together, as these new groups are random. Researchers then examine the association between these groups and the health outcomes of interest, such as cardiovascular disease. If the genetic variants are found to be significantly associated with the outcome, it suggests a potential causal relationship between alcohol consumption and cardiovascular disease. One of the first studies to do this in the alcohol field was in 2014. The BMJ meta-analysis found that carriers of the genetic variant associated with lower alcohol consumption tended to drink less than non-carriers and that they also had a lower risk of developing coronary heart disease. And in 2022, a study in the journal Cardiology of 370,000 people from the UK adjusted data to acknowledge the different lifestyles of participant groups and by using Mendelian randomization, and concluded that there was a consistently risk-increasing association between all amounts of alcohol consumption and both hypertension and coronary heart disease, with modest increases in risk with light alcohol intake and exponentially greater risk increases at higher levels of consumption. But this is only one kind of evidence and we need to consider the totality of, of all different types of evidence. Um, Mendelian randomization, it, it uses a proxy for alcohol consumption rather than observing what is actually consumed. Um, so they're not a complete um, answer to our problems with um, trying to uh, study this issue. Previous observational studies have mostly been in older populations of Caucasians, meaning the data has not been globally representative to begin with. The UK Biobank is a typical example, as it is a large cohort study that only recruited adults aged 40 to 69 at the study's baseline measurements in 2006 to 2010. The response rate to participating in the study was only 5%, and overall participants in the UK Biobank were considerably more likely to be older and healthier than the UK population. And using this unrepresentative sample finds associations between moderate drinking and better cardiovascular health. In 2021, a study took the UK biobank data and adjusted it to make it more representative of the UK population. 
Initially, the biobank data suggested that drinking five or more times a week protected against dying from cardiovascular disease. But after improving how well the data set represented the UK population, the protective effect vanished. And then there's the question of the alcohol industry's influence on research and issues of misinformation. The most shocking example of this was the worldwide Moderate Alcohol and Cardiovascular Health, or MAC, trial in 2018, which was forced to be terminated due to industry influence within the NIAAA, the US governmental body funding and running the trial. Two thirds of the $100 million trial was funded by five alcohol giants, AB InBev, Carlsberg, Diageo, Heineken and Pernod Ricard. An investigation by the National Institutes of Health, which NIAAA is a part of, stated that interactions among several NIAAA staff and industry representatives appear to intentionally bias the framing of the scientific premise in the direction of demonstrating a beneficial health effect of moderate alcohol consumption. One executive from Spirits Europe contacted NIAAA and stated that You mentioned the proposed work NIAAA plans on a conference on the benefits of alcohol and the possibility of clinical trials to show the J-curve in all its glory. There were also reassurances by researchers that the results of the trial would align with the interests of the alcohol industry, with a researcher from the Harvard Medical School writing that one of the important findings will be showing that moderate drinking is safe. The evolution of studies regarding alcohol and cardiovascular health over the past decade has been illuminating, and explains why leading organisations promoting cardiovascular health have come to the simple conclusion that alcohol is not good for the heart. And discussion that focuses on cardiovascular effects alone misses the bigger picture anyway. So even if we thought that there were small protective benefits um, in terms of our heart health in, from drinking small or moderate amounts of alcohol, we need to place this in the context of all other um, risks to our physical and mental health. So, for example, we know that drinking any amount of alcohol is associated with an increased risk from lots of different cancers and there is a, a clear link between the short-term effect of drinking alcohol and um, injuries and accidents. The advice of heart charities and governments regarding heart health is simple. It can be improved by doing more physical activity and by eating and drinking healthily, but not by drinking alcohol.